A while ago, I made a video about the Apple SuperDrive, which, unbelievably, Apple still sells to this day for $79. And that got me thinking, I've never used a Blu-ray drive on macOS, Windows, or even Linux. Then I saw this totally weird balls device, and I knew I had to try it. It's not only a Blu-ray drive that works with USB-A or USB-C using this goofy cable, it's also a DVD-RW drive, a USB hub, a SD card reader, surely a combo that not very many people were asking for, for $56. For this video, I decided to drive eastward to visit stops on the Oregon Trail as this is going to be a bit of a journey, as there's a surprising amount of ground to cover. I'll be testing all these features, including using this drive to try and play PlayStation 3 games on a Mac, a tutorial on how to get Blu-ray playback working on both Intel and Apple Silicon Macs, explaining the goofiness of Blu-ray formats, a tiny bit of PNW tourism, and even doing the irrational, plugging this into a Power Mac G4 to see what happens. Blu-ray as a format is convoluted. As far as data disks go, it's straightforward and uses the updated version of Universal Disk Format, aka UDF, originally developed for DVDs. UDF addressed many of the limitations of ISO 9660 for CDs, so out of the box, Blu-rays are compatible with a huge amount of operating systems. The Blu-ray movie format was not embraced by Apple, nor even Microsoft. Thus, consumers could not buy a Blu-ray drive and simply pop it in and play a movie, unlike DVDs. Playback hinges on third-party software, and the instructions that I could find were not complete, nor did they cover the differences between Apple Silicon and Intel Macs. So I'm publishing written instructions to my blog and GitHub to complement this video. As always, I'm there for the community. Check the description for links. The lack of support boils down to codex licensing and JRE, not to be confused with the Joe Rogan experience, but rather the Java runtime environment. Also, Java would like you to know that it's not to be confused with JavaScript. I have a habit of geeking out on codex and bit rates and a lot of trivial bullshit, but I've learned my viewers mostly don't care. So here's a list of the codex that can be used on a Blu-ray movie, and I'll just leave it at that. Well, I can't help myself, so I'll make this really quick. I need to call out one thing. A 1080p Blu-ray is roughly 40 megabits per second. A Netflix movie at the same resolution is roughly 4 to 7 megabits per second. Apple TV is about 8 megabits per second. More bits equals less compression equals better picture quality. For consumers, Blu-ray is the pinnacle of audiovisual quality. All right, enough. So far, none of the things that I've mentioned would make Blu-ray convoluted. So let's get to that. Blu-ray is a umbrella term as you have three types of Blu-ray. The standard Blu-ray comes in a single layer 25 gigabytes or dual layer 50 gigabyte disc used for 1080p. This format was famously used for the PlayStation 3 and 4. The next Blu-ray format is Ultra HD Blu-ray, which comes in 66 gigabyte discs and triple layer 100 gigabyte discs used to deliver 4K and HDR video. UHD Blu-ray is supported by the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5. And finally, we have Blu-ray XL, aka BDXL, which is confusingly 100 gigabytes triple layer like UHD Blu-ray, but is not compatible with Ultra HD Blu-ray players unless otherwise noted. It also comes in a quad layer 128 gigabyte variant as BDXL is designed for data archival purposes as you can't EMP a physical disc. It comes in versions that are designed not to suffer disc rot and supposedly will last for several hundred years, which is much longer than DVD-Rs and CD-Rs. Despite what you read on Reddit, BDXL is not UHD Blu-rays. The drive I bought only lists Blu-ray support, but we'll test that later. Since macOS does not support Blu-ray movies, the best software is VLC. If you don't know it, it's a open source video player that's now been around for 23 years. However, you can't just stick a disc in and play it with VLC as that would be sane. This leads us to LibAACS, a research project by Videoland, the makers of VLC, 
for Advanced Access Content System, a thing I knew that totally existed before I made this video. AACS, this thing that I'm totally a certified expert in and not reading off the Wikipedia page, is a digital rights management system for Blu-ray and the failed HD DVD format. The Lib AACS project does not offer any keys or certificates to decode encrypted media, so this is where we get into a legally gray area. So let's walk through the process. If you're not interested in the tutorial portion of this video, just feel free to skip ahead using chapters or just tune out for a minute as this won't take long. First, download and install VLC. Next, you'll need Homebrew. Homebrew is a command line interface package manager utility. Think of it as a app store for open source command line software. Go to the brew.sh website and run the curl command by copy and pasting it into your terminal and then following the instructions it gives you. Once it's installed, you can test to see if it's working by typing brew into the terminal. Next, we're gonna run the following command, brew install lib AACS. This will take a minute. So meanwhile, we'll go to find the UK online database and we're going to download the keydb.cfg file as these are the missing certificates for the lib AACS library. As an English speaker using English media, I am going to download the English version. Once the key.dbcfg is downloaded, we need to place it into the right spot. Next, go to your user directory. If your library in your user directory is not visible, go to View Options and make sure the library option is checked. Open the library and then open the Preferences folder. Inside the Preferences folder, we'll create a new folder named AACS in all lowercase. Then drag the keydbcfg file into this directory. Once our brew install is finished for libAACS, we now need to move an alias for libAACS into another location. This is so VLC can find it. The location where Homebrew installs applications will be different on Intel and Apple Silicon Macs. Run the command brew space dash dash prefix to see where brew is installing to. Navigate to the root of your boot drive and hit command shift period to display hidden files. You'll need to navigate to the directory that was spit out in the brew prefix command. Then open the homebrew folder. As of recording this, this will be the op directory for Apple Silicon and USR local for Intel Macs. If you're using Apple Silicon Mac, go inside the homebrew folder. Navigate into the seller folder and then open libAACS. In this folder, there should be a version number like mine is 0.11.1 as of making this video. If I open it and go into lib, you'll see that there is a libAACS.dilib, which is an alias. In another window, which is the same on both Apple Silicon and Intel Macs, go to USR local lib and copy the alias into this directory. Thus concludes the tutorial portion of this video and the written instructions can be found in the description to make your life easier. I figure I'd take a quick break to explain where I am. The majority of this video was filmed along the Columbia River in central Oregon and Washington. When most people think of Oregon, Washington, they think of dense green forests, but if you look around, right here in Washington, in Columbia Hills Park, there aren't very many trees, and that's because both states are roughly half desert. This area gets about 11 inches annually of rainfall. Of course, I caught it on a day that it actually rained, but I did manage to visit Stonehenge. Yes, really, there's a Stonehenge in central southern Washington, and it happens to be the first World War I memorial in the United States. I wanted to do more as this is kind of an unusual film location, but it is cold and wet, so moving on. Now VLC is ready to play Blu-ray discs, assuming you have a Blu-ray drive, and we do, or at least I do. So let's explore this funky drive. The cord is jammed into the bottom of the case, which makes it slightly better designed than the Apple Super Drive, but the cable is still hardwired to the drive and the cable is quite short. It also uses this totally backwards USB-A and USB-C dongle, and I've encountered something like this on a device or two with similar setups, and it's always on the jankiest of devices. But since one of them is USB-C, which is wonderful for my MacBook 2017 and my M1 Max, I'll let it slide. Plug it in and it works. Well, it takes a bit of time to mount, so let's time it. While waiting, I have to say inserting a disc takes me back in time because it's been a long time since I've used any drive that has a spindle. The only devices in my life I ever had were from the 90s, like a portable CD player, the Sony PlayStation, and a boombox. Everything else was a tray or slot loader. 
and it's done. Now we can finally fire up VLC with our properly installed lib AACS. And we're going to play a movie by going to open disk and we're able to play optical media. This is the legally gray part because VLC does not enforce copy protection, so I can capture the screen. But I'm going to limit this so I don't get any copyright violations. The size of this drive is not the smallest. The Apple Super Drive has considerably a smaller footprint, but when it comes down to thickness, they're pretty much equal despite the cable stashing situation below. There has to be slimmer drives on the market, but I haven't seen them. My obvious first thought was to try and daisy chain these two drives, but the Super Drive is very finicky and only seems to work when plugged directly into a USB port. My dreams of ripping both Blu-rays and DVDs while using a single USB port was dashed, at least for today. I decided to try the USB ports on the back of the Blu-ray drive, this time for real. What's interesting is one of the ports is blue, indicating that at least one port is a USB 3.0 port, although System Reporter sees the entire hub as USB 2.0, which calls into question the utility of this entire USB hub, and more so the SD card readers. A computer like my MacBook 2017 does not have a card reader, so even a slow card reader is better than no card reader, and neither my MacBook Pro M1 Max or my MacBook 2017 have a micro SD card reader. The card readers and USB ports are functional, but we'll come back to the performance. Next up, I tried to burn a DVD, and sure enough, it works. In the system reporter, I noticed that it said it was a Blu-ray burner, and I didn't realize this when I bought it. And I can't say how fast it is, because apparently I didn't read the description and I didn't buy any Blu-ray media. I wondered perhaps if this drive perhaps had any off-label functionality, so I decided to try a PlayStation 5 disc in it, which is UHD Blu-ray. The drive just ejected them after trying to read them. The stranger part is it did the same when I tried PlayStation 4 discs. This even happened with the PlayStation 3 disc I tried. I'm guessing the firmware on this particular drive is not compatible. This is supremely disappointing as at some point in the future, our PCS3 is likely going to offer a superior experience for playing some PlayStation 3 games, much like PCSX2 does for playing PlayStation 2 games. I have videos on both those emulators and how to use them if you're curious. So check the description or my channel for those videos. A quick search on Reddit and I found people asking what drives are compatible and people getting answers. So if PS3 gaming is something you care about, I'd start my search there. Now to circle back to the USB hub performance. The benchmarks are boring to see in real time, but I used a Samsung T7, USB-C SSD, and ran the tests on my Apple Silicon M1 Max using amorphous disk drive, first connected directly to my M1 Max, and then the USB hub on the Blu-ray drive. If you guessed that this thing performed at USB 2.0 speeds, you would be correct. It's under 40 megabytes a second. If I had been using USB 3.0, this would have been a respectable 600 megabytes a second. The USB 3.0 port is a lie. As a USB hub, this thing is kind of garbage. It certainly gives you more USB ports, but so does any USB hub. It wouldn't be particularly useful for any storage utilities as it's very slow. I imagine for many viewers, they can download stuff faster than USB 2.0 transfer speeds. Now for some dumb experiments. My Power Mac G4 is now the world's worst G4, as it has been sitting sadly in an unfinished mess as my power supply swap failed. But it's working. I plugged in the drive, stuck in a Blu-ray disc, and OS 10.4 Tiger was unable to read it. This was not surprising. There was an outside chance that OS X's UDF support would be enough, but apparently UDF 2.5 is not backwards compatible with UDF 1.02. It does function as an external DVD drive, which it was able to read my Windows 10 DVD that I burned, which has no hope of ever installing. It also showed up as a USB hub, but the card readers didn't work. The last thing to do was to measure the power draw. When idling without a disc, it's resting at about 1.3 watts, and when playing a movie, it's about 4.3 watts. While that might not sound bad, compare it to the Apple Super Drive, which is DVD only, but it idles at a much lower 0.2 watts, and when playing a movie, it's only 2 watts. Even when you account for the USB hub, it's still more than it should be. On the subject of power, the Blu-ray drive comes with a what the hell is this cable, and it looks like it's for additional power draw, perhaps for the USB hub, but when I plugged it in, the drive wouldn't connect. 
I could have explored this further, but quite frankly, I didn't care. Now this particular drive that I bought isn't entirely unique. Amazon is flooded with a lot of these Chinese white label Blu-ray drives with USB hubs. They're weird, but sadly not as utilitarian as one would hope. They're just USB hubs with slow card readers, which is of limited value. Sadly, these aren't as interesting as I thought they would be. You'd still want a USB 3.1 dongle, and of course, those draw less power and have more functionality. I have this really strong suspicion that it doesn't matter which brand of these you buy, they're all going to feature the same USB hub that's USB 2.0 along with the card readers and they're not going to perform well at all. The drive will work fine and that's good enough for most people and they'll never know about these terrible ports. Also, the construction on this particular unit is not awe-inspiring because there's even like nicks and such on the construction of the plastic housing. So I would not buy this particular model, but it appears that I bought the last one, so you can't anyways. I guess I'll just return this drive and eventually track down one that can read PlayStation 3 games. What I won't be returning is the Lord of the Rings trilogy I bought off eBay for $30 as I didn't have any Blu-ray media to test. Now I'm not sure what to do with these, hold on to these or sell them, who knows. Videos like this get kind of expensive. And as kind of a bonus thing, yeah, uh, during the middle 19th century, the Deschutes River was a major obstacle for immigrants on the Oregon Trail. To paraphrase the signage, early immigrants would often hire local Indians as guides, the later there was a ferry, and finally there was a toll bridge. Despite being a major river on the Oregon Trail, this was not in the classic computer game. 